From the official expansion pack to Oblivion, the Holy Crusader has returned. By combining a one-handed weapon and shield style, he is a walking defensive tank, supplemented by the holy power of the Divines themselves. This build was tested on Legendary Difficulty with Deadly Combat and Revenge of the Enemies, so your experience may differ. Stay tuned after the storyline for the mod loadout and setup instructions. As a Knight of the Nine, you begin equipped with mid to high grade armor. An improved version of your armor does exist somewhere in Skyrim. Although you'll begin knowing Hammer of Justice, Holy Bolt, Divine Light, and Divine Armor from your training in the Priory of the Eight, as an initiate in the Order, these spells are beyond your ability to cast at present. This leaves you with a sword and board warrior style until your magic gets high enough and you become a spellcaster hybrid. Your Hammer of Justice is a magically conjured replica of the Mace of Zenithar that the original Divine Crusader used. The more you use your Hammer of Justice, the quicker it'll level up, and when it levels up you'll be able to invest perks in it. You will be able to specialize your Hammer of Justice to increase its damage with your Conjuration skill. Similarly, you can specialize your Holy Bolt into Divine Avenger that will deal damage equal to your current health once every three minutes. And your Hammer's Faithful Avenger ability will allow it to instantly refresh that cooldown every time your hammer makes a kill. Now in terms of your ability synergizing, your Holy Bolt and your Hammer of Justice are perfect partners. But what makes you real badass is your shield, because straight from the start, you'll be able to use time blocks to daze your enemy. With the proper perks, Shield Bash really does make you the biggest badass. Assuming your enemy is capable of being knocked down, and you have over 90% stamina left, a shield bash will guarantee their knockdown. Over 75% stamina has a high chance of knocking them down, and anything lower is exponentially lower chance. This pretty much makes you overpowered for one-on-one -on -one fights. However, it allows you to survive in fights that you couldn't normally survive due to overwhelming numbers. It's all about control, and as long as you can control your powers, control your stamina, control your enemies, you will prevail. However, should the fight get out of control, you can die in an instant. Due to the guilt he feels for his misspent youth having indulged in a noble's lifestyle prior to his finding faith, he has become a repentant hero. And this takes the form of a drive that he feels the need to help others, to serve the divines, and to uphold the law. The knight is guided by Talos, but he wants to uphold the law. This creates an inner conflict. Although he is a member of the Knights of the Eight, the voice of Talos, Hail, Knight with a worthy heart, has guided him to Skyrim. His faith in the Nine is unwavering, but he has always been an upstanding citizen of the Empire. This contradiction may lead to inconsistent dialogue choices early on before he makes his commitment. Due to his faith in Talos, he will ultimately choose to join the Stormcloaks, but until he makes that commitment, he will remain a lawful citizen of the Empire, and will stay out of any skirmishes between the two forces. Many things could trigger his commitment to the Stormcloaks, but in my case, it was a discussion with a group of Thalmor on the road. They took issue to my faith, and a battle began. And so you will die a heretic's death. While the knight wanders Skyrim helping people with their daily problems, he also focuses on making Skyrim a safer place. And that means when presented with the option to join the Dawn Guard, he would jump at the chance, fend off the vampire menace. He may also choose to join the companions, although he would instantly spurn the idea of drinking werewolf blood and he would spurn pretty much every Daedric task there was set before him, because he is true to the Divines in all things. Aside from the Novice Conjuration perk in order to make his Hammer of Justice easier to use, he will never make use of the Foul Magic, nor any other magics besides Alteration for Divine Armor and Restoration for Divine Light and Holy Bolt. Although he'll end up learning many more spells in Alteration and Restoration over time, Things like that, illusion and sneaking, run contrary to his chivalrous code as a knight, 
and therefore will never be used. Although he will make use of enchanting in the future, he would never trap another living creature's soul. So instead, he will seek out and find a ring of soul filling that once a day will fill one of his soul gems with ambient energy from the world. As he is sworn to wear the tabard of his order, it is very unlikely he would ever take up blacksmithing. As for alchemy, he is forbidden from using poison as it is very dishonorable. However, potions are a form of medicine making and are highly valued by his order. As an imperial, he already invokes the voice of the emperor to avoid battles and spare lives when possible. However, he is seen in the more advanced knights such as the one who recruited him that Beechcraft is actually an invaluable tool of the knighthood. For those truly gifted in it can instill courage in all their followers through a battle anthem. Fragments of the vision that Talos gave him that brought him to Skyrim in the first place will cause him to seek out a tormented ghost of a Knight of the Nine near the Tower Stone between Dawnstar and Winterhold. The vision will also drive him to visit a forgotten shrine to the north of Solitude. He will more than likely do these things almost immediately, as these are the clues to the greater prophecy that has yet to be revealed to him. It wasn't uncommon for priests who dedicated themselves to a single divine to gain incredible magic in that divine sphere of influence without actual magical study as a mage would. However, the exceptionally rare are those who dedicate themselves to all the divines at once. They were known as the Knights of the Nine. Normally, a knight was bound to a single noble lord, but these were free knights who didn't have any lords except the divines themselves. The Order of the Nine's fate was a tragic one, and in the Third Era, 150, nothing of it remained except for the Priory of the Nine itself. The protection that the divines offered prevented it from crumbling into dust, until the seventh champion of Cyrodiil, the hero of Kavach, appeared traveling to all nine way shrines and obtaining the sacred relics of the order, he became the second divine crusader successoring the founder of the Knights of the Nine. The divine crusader took the dead order and revived it, recruiting a new order of free knights. It wasn't long afterward, in the first year of the fourth era, that the divine crusader, the seventh champion of Cyrodiil, vanished from the mortal world forever. Despite its best efforts, the knighthood would never be at the forefront of history again. The Knights of the Nine never sought adoration, fame, or wealth, and it was never bestowed upon them again, although their knighthood did endure. A huge misconception is that the Oblivion Crisis only happened in Cyrodiil. It happened all over Tamriel. The elves were hit especially hard. It took quite some time for them to recover. The political upheaval was tremendous, and it allowed the old faction of the Eldmeri Dominion, the Thalmor, to take power once again. 21 years after the Champion of Cyrodiil disappeared, the Thalmor officially came to power. Due to the coup d'etat, the Somerset Isles were renamed to Alinor, and the third Eldmeri Dominion was officially formed. It wouldn't be another 149 years until the war with the Empire begins under cover of darkness, storm, and illusion magic. The Aldmeri Dominion launches a surprise attack on the Imperial City. The Imperial Legion suffers staggering losses as it holds the line so that civilians, the Elder Council, and the Royal Family can get away. For the first time since the formation of the Empire, the White Gold Tower returns to the hands of its original owners. But that is not where this story ends. The battle to retake the Imperial City is the battle in which the Knights of the Nine would have participated. The Imperial Legion was already broken. They had to rely on mercenaries and anyone who would put their foot forward. The Knights of the Nine would have sacrificed everything to defend the Empire. Because at the end of the treaty signing, Talos worship was banned. Officially, the Knights of the Nine would disband as well. As with the Temple of the Divines, the Nine became eight. And so a new order of knights came forth, known as the Knights of the Eight. Bear in mind that unlike most divine worshippers, 
The Knights of the Nine visit all the way shrines and receive wisdom from each divine. It is for that reason that their faith is unshakable. The Knight of the Nine is an Imperial, born to the noble families of either Breville or Anvil, two cities that were completely destroyed by the Thalmor when they invaded Cyrodiil at the beginning of the war. He lived a soft, pampered lifestyle and took all the pleasures in the world for granted, knowing none of the suffering. That is, until his world collapsed around him. It was only knowing the absolute despair of having lost everything that brought him faith. And a chance meeting with one of the commanders of the Knights of the Eight caused him to join the Order. Because the Order was hurting for members at the time, he was allowed to defer his path through the Way Shrines until he had learned all the basics of being a knight. And although he was taught the knowledge on how to use these holy powers, he had never actually gone through the full training, so his body and spirit were not ready to wield them, despite having the knowledge. Uplifted out of despair by his newfound faith, and empowered with the knowledge of a knight, he set forth on the path of the Eight Way Shrines, and in doing so, found the Ninth Way Shrine, the Way Shrine of Talos. Hail, Knight with a worthy heart! It was there that he saw a dark prophecy where two sides fought in war and a looming shadow sought to eradicate them all. Doom was coming to the world. If Talos was not a true divine, then Talos would not have spoken to him. Talos was a man and a god. He knew this to be true. So what did that mean about the Empire that had turned its back on Talos? The same Talos that was offering him a chance at salvation. Traveling to the southern port, he contemplated this, and then he heard it. There are foul tidings from Skyrim. The Greybeards speak of the end of all time. He immediately knew what he had to do. He had to travel to Skyrim, and stop this prophecy from being fulfilled, to follow the path Talos and the other divines had set out for him. Although he was suffering from a crisis of faith, he was still an upstanding and lawful citizen of the Empire, so he would not be caught crossing the border illegally. Instead, he would come to Skyrim by way of ship. Solitude, seat of the Empire. Windhelm, seat of the Stormcloaks. He wasn't sure, but he knew the Stormcloaks hadn't abandoned Talos. So he made the decision to go instead to Dawnstar, where he could slip in unnoticed. This is a listing of the mods used in this build. The first set are the required mods to get the same effect as I do. The second are recommended mods to enhance your overall experience. This build absolutely assumes that you have the common foundation, so go check out that video if you haven't done that already. For any additional mods not listed here, check out the Ultimate Mod Codex. For your arsenal of holy powers as a Knight of the Nine, we will be using Forgotten Magic Redone. You'll be able to use the mod configuration menu whenever one of your holy spells levels up under Paladin to add perks to the various spells that you have leveled up. Now when I say this mod is non-optional, that's because your Holy Bolt, Hammer of Justice, Divine Light, and Divine Armor all come from this mod. The Knights of the Nine mod is going to give your character the look and feel of a Knight of the Nine. You'll be starting off with the worn armor, but you'll be able to upgrade that fairly soon into your regular armor. Now if you want to proceed with playing a Knight of the Nine, but you decide that the sword and board is not for you. You can continue to be a holy avenger of the Knights of the Nine with this Battle Mage set. You can find it under the Vigilance of Stendar's Hall. There is both a Dawn Guard and a non Dawn Guard version. Make sure to install the appropriate one and not both. Successfully captured the spirit of the Knights of the Nine expansion pack, placing it into Skyrim. You will travel all over Skyrim, praying to different divine shrines, and when you've gathered all the scriptures from different dungeons, they're randomly generated scriptures, you will be able to take them back here with the blessings of all the divines, 
and create a prayer which is a power that you can use and the prayer is customizable based on which divines you want to dedicate the prayer to. This is pretty much the adventure for anyone who wants to be a Knight of the Nine. We'll be using the brand new Percus Maximus overhaul for this build. While most of this build's powers come from Forgotten Magic and you could technically skirt by without Percus, there are some pretty major uh, block, armor, and spell perks that you really want to take advantage of in Perkis. You'd pretty much be cheating yourself out of a great experience if you went with a different overhaul. Now for your character's start, they're going to come to Skyrim by ship, specifically to Dawnstar. And to accomplish this, we'll be using alternate start, live another life. The main quest really won't start until you either travel to Helgen, or you participate in the Civil War. This way, your Knight of the Nine can have as many adventures as they want before they discover that they're Dragonborn. They will have the unusual ability to read the dragon language and learn new words, although the ability to use those shouts or unlock them will remain locked until the main quest actually starts. Finally, make sure that your No Starting Spells mod is activated so that you don't have the flames and the generic heal at the beginning. Healing is going to be dealt with by Divine Light, and if you really, really want to use Destruction Spells, which doesn't seem very knightly to me, you could possibly learn them later. Although most mods are natively compatible with Percus Maximus, certain ones that add skills or spells don't have those skills or spells affected by Percus Maximus's perks. These are where these patch collections come in. Find the appropriate patches, such as for Forgotten Magic, so that your Holy Bolt Hammer of Justice, so on and so on, can benefit from Percus Maximus perks. I recommended mods like Magna G, Thunder Child, and Apocalypse, the spell package, will all have compatibility patches available on their individual download pages. If you've got all the mods mentioned up till this point, then congratulations, you've got your build. However, these mods are highly recommended to get the maximum experience out of your game. How many times have you accidentally clicked on an apple or a broom and all of a sudden you're labeled a thief? It doesn't make any sense. It was an accident. I'll put it down. No, you got the bounty anyway. Well, don't worry about that with this mod. This mod blocks all stealing when you're not crouching, specifically stealth. And since you aren't going to be stealthing as a holy knight, there is no reason you should ever be convicted of stealing unless, of course, you were to read a book and then click the take button. That's the only exception. Deadly combat just improves the difficulty of combat in general. Melee range has been greatly reduced so you actually have to get in people's faces to melee them. And when being struck by a melee blow, you can get staggered, especially if you're trying to cast a spell. Chris Maximus has actually appropriated some of its functionality, so you're going to want to go into the mod configuration menu and turn off block stamina cost, and on the other menu, timed blocking. Percus Maximus already has a stamina cost, and you don't want the two to double dip, that's why you disable it in Deadly Combat. Likewise, timed blocking is also handled by Percus Maximus, and there are perks to improve your timed blocking functionality. All of that gets overwritten when timed blocking is on in Deadly Combat, so we want to fix that by disabling it in Deadly Combat. Revenge of the Enemies is going to allow enemies to use what they should have been able to use in the first place. Uh, high Elves will use Highborn, Orcs will use their Blood Rage, Vampires will be able to turn into a swarm of bats and teleport, so on, so on, so on. If you decide you want to use Enchanting as a Knight of the Nine, I recommend Winter Mist so you can get that Ring of Soul filling. For all the Standing Stones, I recommend the Lord Stone for the Knight of the Nine, assuming you have Aurora, because it makes better Standing Stone powers. The Apocalypse Spell Package is going to give you more Restoration and Alteration spells to work with, considering you're limited by theme. Thunder Child, when you do discover that you're the Dragonborn, is going to give you more shouts and a very immersive way of learning them. Finally, Spectroverse and Dwemer Tech, and while I recommend installing the bottom two adventure mods right away, I recommend on holding off on actually progressing those adventures until after you've basically grown tired of vanilla Skyrim world as it is. They are awesome adventures, but when they're done, they're done. All these mods are created by the same author, and almost all of them, if you go to the files section on their download page, you're going to see a 
purchase Maximus Compatibility Patch. That will ensure that any and all spells and abilities added by this mod are able to be properly used by Perkis Maximus Perks. I have a big problem with some of Skyrim's dialogue, and that's, why would I ever choose that option? I want a third option to say something completely different. This is one of those cases where I would make the blades see reason, obviously using uh, speechcraft skill, but uh, the idea is, is that you don't have to kill the dragon, you can actually find another way and still appease the blades. After arriving at Dawnstar, your character should look something like this. You should immediately hit the tilde key to open up the command console. Then type help, quote, knights of the nine, sword, end quote. You're going to see three types. Knights of the Nine Sword, Reforged, and Warforged. Obviously, Reforged and Warforged is for functionality we'll see later in the game. We don't want to cheat, we just want to create our loadout. So, player, add item, 6F0048D0. You see, the 6F is the mod code. And what will happen is the rest of the code will stay the same no matter what game you're playing. However, every time you change your mods, those first two characters are going to be different. So, if you try to put in this code, it's not going to work in your game because your mod loadout is going to be slightly different. That's just the reality. After you put in the full code for the item, put space and one. This will produce one of that item. So now you have a Knights of the Nine Arming Sword. Go ahead and repeat this process with the following codes. As you can see, they all share the same mod code as the first item. The reason the Warforged ones have a different mod code is that's because they were created by Patches Maximus in response to the mod adding that item. And Patches Maximus will always create upgradable versions of every item in the game when the patches run. Now go to your inventory menu and equip the set. You'll notice that the chest piece is the worn down version and you'll find an improved version later on in the game. Now for your holy magic, return to the console. Once again, we're going to type help forgotten magic colon holy bolt and in closed quotes. There should be only one result and it's a book. So we're going to player dot add item In this case, 73 was the mod code. Obviously, the mod code will be different for each game. Then navigate back to where it says F1. Set it as F0 and hit enter. Next, you're going to want to go ahead and change it to F2. And then F3. Congratulations, now you have all four starting spells. Go ahead and learn them. Now when you go to your magic menu, you'll see all of them cost way too much to be able to use. You might be able to get off one divine light and that's about it. We'll eventually fix this later through your character's progression, but for now, you are a sword and board warrior. The build can be considered mostly complete at level 40 in terms of perks. The left wing of the light combat tree will handle bleeds and should be fully filled out. As for the center column, simply go along the blunt weapon side. When you hit Dervish, you will gain the ability to knock people down with your regular attacks. To black is the final perk that you will need out of light weaponry. You will not be getting the mastery. The block tree should be filled out from both sides. But because your Crusader Shield is considered a heavy type, you should be going for Guardian's Trick instead of Dispel. After Guardian's Trick, Shove is where your shield becomes fairly overpowered. It requires 55 skill to obtain. Power Bash synergizes with Shove, making it a lot easier. Finally, the mastery you should choose is called Last Stand. Last Stand basically makes you invincible as long as you're blocking. It is not a once-per-day ability, you merely have to get out of combat to rest in order to use it again. 
Now you'll immediately notice an issue with your spells costing a lot of magicka. And a big part of that is that your armor is actually increasing the cost of casting magic. This will be fixed at 50 skill when you are able to obtain Mind Cage and spells will become a lot more accessible to you. In the Speechcraft tree, it's recommended that you pick up Eloquence as soon as possible. 30% easier persuasion. You'll find that the double chance of intimidation is very good, especially when thieves come and you have a chance to talk with them first. You can avoid the fight. And the night is all about preserving life when possible. The battle anthem is not a priority. It's something you'd dump your unneeded perks into, and as is heroism. As I mentioned earlier, you want to put one perk into conjuration and one perk into alteration. This will help reduce the cost of these spells. As for restoration, you're going to want to travel up the left tree to regrowth, which will make your healing spells 25% stronger, and then you want to pick up respite and Respite will simply cause you to recover stamina as you heal yourself. After that, you're going to want to travel up the main tree to Master. And Defy Death is optional. However, under no circumstances should your character be taking the Right Wing, which is all about diseases, curses. It is the death side of Restoration. Instead, you should be focusing on the left side, which will allow you to get the Idol which will be your magical focus for your character. It will make all of your healing spells 20% stronger, that is on top of the 20% stronger you already got, bringing it to 40% stronger. Furthermore, activating auras will no longer cost magicka and you will have an aspect of brilliance which will increase your damage and your allies damage and decrease enemy damage. All in all, it is just a great thing to be as a paragon of the light. When you feel that your build is entirely complete, you'll want to go into enchanting and begin working your way up the chain. After you hit advanced scripture, you will have a choice. The right side will make you a master at crafting scrolls. The left side will make you a master at crafting staves. If you plan to be a battle mage in any way, shape, or form, then the left side is for you. Otherwise, the right side is an easier way to cast spells without draining your magicka. You'll find, however, that the mod configuration menu for Forgotten Magic, specifically the Paladin Tree, will have most of your character progression. Now, all of your base spells have 10 possible perks that you can specialize into, but only 5 of them may be used at a time. Be very careful about checking your boxes, because once checked, they will be permanent. You'll have to spend a Dragon Soul in order to refund that spells perks. Now due to its magicka cost, Divine Armor is probably going to be the slowest leveling spell you have. Because compared to the cost, it doesn't really have that many benefits until you actually start specializing it. So it will take some active effort on your part in order to power level Divine Armor into usefulness. That said, once it is useful, it is insanely useful. Divine Light is your standard healing spell. You should be using it frequently whenever you are damaged and you're not in combat. As you desire never to become a vampire nor be afflicted by any diseases, cleanse is almost required on your divine light progression. Furthermore, I highly recommend Radiance of Light if you have any followers with you. That way, when you heal yourself, you'll be healing your followers as well. Furthermore, if you feel like you have to keep healing for some reason, you're taking a constant flow of damage, you should look into Divine Plea, which will cause your divine light to have a heal over time effect. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this video, you should always specialize into Divine Avenger with Holy Bolt because it's going to deal your health's amount of damage to the enemy with a three minute cooldown. And with Faithful Avenger, your Hammer of Justice is going to reset that cooldown every time you kill someone with your hammer. Also, Light's Hammer is practically mandatory for Hammer of Justice because it will cause the hammer to scale with your Conjuration level, and Conjuration goes up just by you summoning the hammer. Because you are a Holy Crusader, I highly recommend picking up Banish, which will cause your Holy Bolt to deal double damage to undead. That includes Dragon Priest. And obviously, Healer's Wrath is a must because it increases Holy Bolt damage by 25% of your restoration, causing your Holy Bolt to scale as well. Although you have Holy Bolt, I highly recommend picking up a crossbow at the Dawnguard Keep. 
The reason is because you may need to hit enemies at range and you may be out of magicka at the time. If you have Aurora installed, you'll find that the Lord Stone is the ideal stone power for your character. Your attack damage is increased by 30% while above half health, but reduced by 30% when below half health. But luckily, combined with your Divine Light, this should not be an issue, because you're going to want to stay at max health all the time for Holy Bolt anyway. Finally, as a desperation move, the Lord Stone gives you Kneel or Be Knelt, where you can knock everyone down as a... You're out of stamina, you can't shield bash, you're going to die. Well, guess what? Use Kneel or Be Knelt, drink a potion, and back up. Give yourself some time for that potion to kick in. If you fulfilled the Forgotten Shrine quest, a Divine Prayer will be yours once per day, and it will have customized abilities the way you want them. There's a lot more to think about when truly mastering your Knight of the Nine. However, Light Weaponry Offense, Shield and Heavy Armor Defense, and Restoration, and you should be fine. Eventually, Dawn Guard and other sources are going to provide you with even more Restoration spells to use, such as Vampire's Bane and Stendar's Aura. And you're going to be glad that you picked those perks. Now just a heads up, these values are intended for endgame after you've gotten all your perks and abilities. But basically, I recommend taking Sky Tweak and going to combat. And under Legendary Difficulty, I recommend increasing the amount of damage you do by 25%, bringing it up to 0.50. On the other side, damage taken legendary, I recommend bringing that up to five times normal value. You're gonna have these amazing, amazing block perks that are basically gonna make you a mortal as long as you block properly and at the right time. So, the idea behind the five times normal damage is if you screw up and die, it's your own damn fault. Another really cool tweak you can do is you can take the 20 times real world speed that Skyrim travels at, as far as the passage of time goes, and reduce that down to about 8. Anything less than 5 will break certain quests, but uh, 20 times real world speed is kind of fast and you find days flying by for no good reason. But nothing on this tweak list is set in stone. I highly recommend messing with it until you find a Skyrim that you are most comfortable with. The same goes for pretty much everything in this build. I highly recommend playing the Skyrim that you enjoy. If you have any comments, questions, tell me what you think about the build. Leave it in the comments section here. If you have any other builds you think I should do, leave it in the comments section. All in all, I gotta say, this build has been damn fun to play. Okay, so watch watch her, watch her. Bam! Okay, off you go. I mean, anyone on a bridge is fair game. Look at that, shield charge. Oh! Okay, I'm not liking the fireballs. I'm not liking them at all. Let's uh, go ahead and divine light this. There we go. Oof! Arrow didn't really hurt me. Let's hit my shoe. Hear them suffering? That's because they're in range of my aura. Ah! He's got fire spell. <laughs> Goodbye, bandit chief! I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did. This build is just some crazy fun. And you can use Sky Tweak to tweak it to your heart's content to keep it difficult, but uh, really, whether you want it easy or hard, the mods make it possible. Now, uh, let's do a shield charge right here. Here we go. <laughs> Goodbye, Khajiit. If you've never seen a character build for Skyrim before, I recommend checking out Fudge Muppet and uh, his videos. It's what inspired me to make this. Yeah, all my characters lately have been mages, and people have been asking me, when are you going to do something different? Well, I thought about it, and your generic weapon using Dragonborn is just... It's played out. I mean, I figured I'd come up with something a little different, something a little exciting. And uh, this was my answer to that. And I think I can keep coming up with ideas like this. Uh, obviously, 
Some people want me to keep doing Offensive Skyrim, other people are waiting for my next Brutal Skyrim episode. And, uh, but the thing is that I'm always looking to do something new and different. Like most of my Skyrim, I live stream this on Twitch TV forward slash the Hawkeron. I recommend checking it out. And I don't just stream Skyrim there, I stream pretty much anything I want from Rogue Legacy to uh, Mega Man. My creed has always been with gaming, whatever I feel like at the time. Unless, of course, it's multiplayer. You get me in some multiplayer, I'll uh, join anyone. Uh, Emulet of RK! Flash Shield. I mean, yes, the next offensive Skyrim is coming. Yes, the next brutal Skyrim is coming. But real life always trumps it. My marriage always trumps it. And what's new and interesting always trumps it. Mike knows much. Tell some. Ah, oh, gee, she's doomed to look ugly forever. At least you can't tell from a distance how ugly she is. Imperial Thalmor fight number 12. Looks as crappy as the rest of them. I've heard that the Nords of Skyrim have been warring with the Redoran of Morrowind. More fighting for the Nords? This is sad. This is sad. This is sad. Wait, I have an idea. I have an idea. Okay. Goodbye! 